bang it on the head. <laughs> um, but uh, but thanks for making the time. I'm I'm looking forward to to the discussion. I know we'll probably talk through a couple of things that um, you know are not news to me, um, but I think are worth sharing uh, with a wider audience and people getting to know a little bit about the backstory of uh, you, um, Tiger Beetle, the journey so far, and what you have you know thinking about going forward with Coil and, and Tiger Beetle. Um, so, yeah, I guess so. Why don't we Why don't we start there? Uh, there's There's an interesting backstory that you and I know about how Tiger Beetle came about. Um, maybe you want to you know give a bit of background on what you were doing before we met and and uh, your your own sort of journey as a software engineer slash accountant. Uh, <laughs> and we can and we can get into the get into the history of Tiger Beetle. Oh, thanks, Eddie. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, when you look back. Um, I guess if you get old enough, maybe you have to get old enough, you know, and you limp back in time and then you connect the dots. Somehow the dots start to make sense. I don't know if that is just compensation for getting older or if now there's more dots that you can sort of piece them together. Uh, but something interesting with me, I, I got into coding when I was young. Uh, I, used, I was always standing over people's shoulders watching them code. And then at a certain point, I decided, well, I, I want to do this myself. So I went to the library and I got the basic books out and and that's how it got started. And then uh, I love doing that. So it came time to choose. Like in South Africa, everybody makes a big fuss. You know, um, what are you going to study at university? And everybody decides and you, you get all these, you know, professional coaching and stuff. I didn't do any of that. But... Basically, I had a list of things that I didn't want to study. Um, and number one on the list, the number one thing I didn't want to study was accounting. Um, maybe number two was computer science. And the reason was, was I loved coding so much that I figured I'd always just be teaching myself. Like my whole life, I'd learned how to do that, like how to learn to code. It was more fun like that. It, it suited the, the, the domain. Um, so I kind of figured I wasn't going to study coding. And then number one on my list of things not to study was accounting. So I kind of the way my reasoning works, I figured, well, let me go and study that then, you know. <laughs> so I studied <laughs> accounting and then, um, but it wasn't long. I couldn't hold off from coding. So in my undergrad year, like three years, um, I already got back into coding and um, got back into software. Like I just started doing my own thing in software, a lot of different projects. And fast forward a few years, I was doing some security work with Microsoft. I was pretty lucky to do that, helping to protect their, their whole software release pipeline uh, from zero days. So writing some static analysis tooling. It was kind of a fun problem. Like if you've got a whole lot of antivirus, like imagine this big pipeline and Microsoft ship a lot of software and all the software that they ship somehow they've got to check it like you know check that there's nothing malicious in the code how do you do that it's a big problem so they've got this big pipeline hundreds of antivirus programs in it and what was happening was hackers were like putting in these like viruses that would attack the pipeline itself and and shut it down so i was doing some like safety and performance work where we were trying to defend the antivirus from the virus so like who, who, who creates the antivirus to defend the antivirus to defend the rest of us from the virus? That was kind of very, the very, very yeah. topical analogy. Um, I like yeah. it. <laughs> I, I guess yeah. you can see, you, you know where I'm going with mm -hmm. this, right? So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, the, the, so, so go ahead. I, I, I know, I mean, I know uh, the, the backstory, at least of how you and I met, was kind of an unusual one on the side of a soccer field one day. Uh, and uh, I forgot when I asked you that question that you are um, probably one of the more humble people that I know, one of the most humble. So I'm, I, I'm now reminded that for the next hour, I'm going to have to uh, tell everybody uh, a little bit more about you, that you're not going to do it yourself. So I know, you'll, I know you'll speak highly of Tiger Beetle. Um, but but my side of the story of how we met is we were we were uh, I was playing five aside soccer and this guy came past and asked about uh, whether he could join our regular game uh, and he joined and we got chatting 
he brought some beers after the game, I think was the first person ever to, to, to do that. And we got chatting. Turns out he knew a little bit about Node and the intricacies of Node.js. And, and we were currently, this was when I was still at Coil, and we were, we were contributing to the Moduloop project. And one of the challenges that Moduloop was facing was performance. Uh, really struggling to get their payments switch or payments processing hub uh, above, I can't remember what the number was at the time, but it certainly wasn't high enough. And uh, at the time, the, the the proposed solution was how do we make, how do we find somebody who really understands Node.js well, and how do we tune uh, Moduli to perform better? Uh, and and that's how we got you involved. But uh, as it turns out, tuning Node wasn't the solution. Um, so maybe <laughs> maybe you want to maybe you want to talk through a little bit how how we went from let's tune node to let's write a new database uh, at the, uh, at the, on the Moduli project. Yeah, I think the first question one's always got to ask is which problem is easier to solve, you know, tuning Node.js or writing a new database? And like having been in Node for so long and, and looking, you know, how do we tune MySQL also? A lot of MySQL's default settings are all for old hardware. Um, there's hundreds of knobs to tune for for like solid state, you know, disks or NVMe, and Mojuloop was such a big project too. And then I, I don't know, there was a part of me that felt the database would be easier and quicker, you know, and we'd get to a better place. We could, you know, sometimes like if you want to really move things 10x, you almost have to have a new design. And uh, but just to backtrack a bit, like Eddie. I almost didn't sign up to your to the soccer game, but I'm so glad I did because <laughs> it's it's really changed my life. Like meeting you, mm-hmm. and there's yeah, I mean I don't know. You've probably got to be the most solid person I've ever met, and you could already see that on the soccer field. Like this guy's just <laughs> solid. You know, he's just a brilliant, brilliant guy. So I figured. I've been well, trying to lose some weight, so don't worry. No, no, no. I didn't mean solid like that. I mean, they, <laughs> no, more, more just trustworthy, you know, open, trustworthy, and just someone who's considered with their opinion, um, re- like really highly respected. And so it was just so fantastic we could bump into each other like that, and amazing, you know, because Coil is based in San Francisco, and and there's this whole story of how there's a Cape Town office, and you're there, and. Uh, I moved to a new suburb or just around the corner and bump into you. And then we actually bumped into each other at the office again, which was another, you know, and Stefan happened to be, to be visiting. Like, it's just amazing, you know, like all the dots connect. And, um, yeah, but I guess coming back to Mojo Loop, so I, like, so you, you, you put me on Mojo Loop with, with Don and the two of us, yeah, we had a lot of fun, like looking, trying to analyze Mojo Loop, the payment switch, where the bottlenecks, where's the safety risk. And kind of what we saw was there's 10,000 lines of code and there's a database at the heart of it, like MySQL or Postgres. And we always think that databases are so safe, you know, and they are, like they're amazing. So MySQL, Postgres, they, they've had 30 years of, of battle testing. And they're pretty safe, you know, there are ways that they can fail. But I think what we don't look at is that, and this maybe comes back to our topic, like databases of the future, is that databases are all around us. We just don't see them yet. And often they're in the systems that we're working on. We've, we've kind of built them without realizing. And that was sort of what we stumbled into in Mojuloop. But we looked around at the heart of Mojuloop. What was really there was a database. It was a financial system of record to track double entry as you move money within the system. And I think what we hit upon also, what I mean, we just learned it from what was there. We saw it, it jumped out at us, was that most of these systems are not only doing double entry to move money within a system, they're actually doing, um, they're moving money between systems. It's a, it's a network of networks. Uh, and that's the whole trick. Like, how do you move money from one bank to another. They both have different tech stacks, like you've got the Mojuloop tech stack as a switch, um, and that interacts with other systems. And, but how do you like tr- not only track money within a system, but between systems? 
And I think a lot of the other ledgers out there weren't really doing the latter case. But we, so that was kind of like the two big insights. We saw, well, actually, here's a database, and most of it is in JavaScript. It's 10,000 lines around, you know, SQL. So actually, then the safety is quite a concern because you've got so much code that could go wrong, and it wasn't really coded to be a data, you know, to, to database standards. Um, and you're now crossing the network. You know, solving those problems within a database process is much easier than trying to solve them as a collection of microservices. Mm. I don't know what. So, so you're saying, I, yeah. So yeah. no, no. I, I think that's uh, that sounds like a very familiar, you know, description of the problem um, that you you identified that you know a lot of the business logic of what Modulip was doing was accounting, and yet it was a long way from the data. There was a lot of back and forth between where the logic was encoded as JavaScript and the data was stored in the database. Uh, and, and so I think, yeah, you, you mentioned it now, the, the safety challenge there, but obviously the thing that brought you to that was the performance and, and seeing, I think I remember you saying something like there's, you know, 10, 10 queries per transaction back and forth. And each time, you know, the, the control flow is moving from the code back to the database, back to the code. And, and that was the, you know, that was a huge bottleneck. Um, on, on the back of that, what do you think, you know, what do you think was the kind of the aha moment for you to put the code closer to the data? And, and how did you, what was the process to get there? How did you get from, you know, making that, I, I kind of remember the, the report that you and Don put together on that yeah. and, and reading, you know, all of your, your findings. How did you go from that to a design or, or, or a, a, you know, what Tiger Beetle has become today, the, the design that you started conceiving for Tiger Beetle? Okay, yeah, so I think there's two parts to it. The one is kind of wanting to play with the exponent, like really think in terms of orders of magnitude. And I guess the other one was kind of like just a bit of frustration, you know, and then, and then there's this, this moment where you realize we could move to a new... A new we, we kind of like, it's easy for a project to get to a local maxima. Um, and then, then it can take a lot of effort just to get off, you know, and get to another maxima that's going to be a much better maxima. So those were the two things. So I can, I can go into that. But just to say, you know, Don was amazing. Uh, like, he's the coolest partner to have on a, on a, like a performance engineering project. So he, he did his master's in analyzing aircraft vortexes, right? Um, yeah, he's a, he's a very smart guy. <laughs> Which is why he's working at Painbos. <laughs> that, yeah, that's yeah, why it works for you. Something that I think a lot of people don't know about Donny. He actually broke a world record at some point. I don't know if it still stands, but he and his uh, he and his partner at university launched an air-powered rocket higher than anyone's ever launched one before in the world. World record. Um, yeah, Don's Don's yeah. great. Um, yeah, so so, so, so that... let's yeah let's leave some. Let's let's make sure we uh, we we uh, you and I don't spend this whole hour reminiscing, and we get into some database nasties and do okay. it out on databases. So uh, so tell me now, uh, how did you get to how did you get to this design from from realizing you needed to put the code close to the data? Uh, there's a couple of leaps you've got to make to end up with where you are with Tiger Beal. Um, is, was yeah. it a sort of a journey that you took and uh, iterations, or did you have a sort of conceptual idea ahead of time that this is where you'd land? Yeah, okay, great. So, yeah, and I'm remembering too, we've got those two things still to come back to, the, the performance and the playing with the exponents and a bit of frustration. So to add, it, add to that mix was also, um, there was like a social aspect, like if you want to propose a radical new design, how do you go and do that, you know? Um, do you do that immediately as you join the project? Um, like within the first three hours and you say, no, wait, guys, we've got to redo everything. Is that the best way to do that? <laughs> uh, or, or do you wait a little while, deliver some results and then go and do that? Um, and we kind of did, we did the latter. So I remember the very first day we started, Don and I joined the conference. We were the conference, one of, you know, one of the convenings for most people was giving the, the reports, the results back on performance testing for the switch. 
we sat in on that. So we saw, immediately, I'm just joining the project. It's quite overwhelming, so much to look at. But straight away, you're seeing, oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. And then literally within about an hour, Donna, I mean, this was like a three-hour convening. We were sitting in the boardroom. And thanks to you, AD, like the boardroom has got these tables that you can actually draw on. So we were already sketching a, a design for a very simple, like three node system cluster that that would perform better. I straight away, because I, I, I had some of this in my mind already um, from stuff I had worked on before. So we, I kind of could see, okay, we do it. We do it like this, like this, like this, but we didn't want to pitch it right away. We wanted to build up our chits. So we did the analysis work and Don and I drew up that whole document. What was really fun there was we, wrote our own kind of like inspired by web dev you know like if you want to optimize a website you you pull up the website console and you can see what's called a waterfall uh, i'm sure a lot of a lot of you will, will know what that looks like it's it's literally little bars that go from left to right a website is made up of a lot of different files so to see a website you have to download all those files first and then you can see the website and you can scroll it so it's got lots of these little files in there. Sometimes you'll download one file. That will then tell the browser, okay, you now need to also download these other files. So you get you get basically a graph that forms. But another way of looking at it is, is like these waterfall charts. So Don and I took that idea. We wrote a little tool. We traced all the SQL queries that the switch was performing. If you wanted to do one payment, and we ended up with these beautiful waterfall charts. And you can see, okay, here's a payment, and this is the corresponding waterfall chart of all the essential business logic that, that hits the database. And so, yeah, so you touched on it, Eddie. It's about, it was about 18 queries just to do the first leg of a payment. And these payments are between systems, so they're two-phase payments. So that means there's two legs. So it's about 18 queries on the first leg, and maybe it was 20 or 26 on the second, uh, which is all back and forth to the database. Um, that was the first thing you could see straight away. Uh, then we, we spent time with that. We started seeing, well, there were a few bugs. Um, the system wasn't using concurrency as much. It wasn't saturating the hardware around the database and the application layer. But basically, long story short, Don and I, we, we spun up the bare minimum hardware we had this cool concept called minimum viable deployment. So what's the cheapest possible deployment of Mojiloop? Let's spin it up. Let's benchmark it. That's going to be our baseline for operators that are cost conscious. Um, and the performance baseline there was 76 payments a second so that it could do. And that was costing like quite a lot of cloud hardware. And it could do 76 transactions a second. Um, that's another thing, you know, often we look at a database like these modern ones and we say, well, you know, Y database or C database, they can do a million, you know, writes a second, but we forget that that's just the, you know, the raw material. When you start to make that into a finished project with 10,000 lines of ledger code, like in Mojiloop, the performance drops, you know, maybe to 76. Uh, so then mm -hmm. we started digging into that. Um, and we realized, well, what the database is really doing is it's writing to disk and then it's executing it, executing the transaction, you know, and, and changing the state. It always writes to disk first and then it changes the state. And we realized, well, if you've got to write to disk 18 little times to do a payment, that's not very efficient because disks like to, they like to write like one meg at a time. Then they're starting to get nice sequential write bandwidth. If you only do little, little writes, they, you, you always pay a fixed cost for every write. Um, if it's a hard disk, maybe you pay like five milliseconds or something. If it's solid state, it's, it's obviously faster, but there's always a fixed cost. So whether you write a little bit of data or whether you write a lot, you're always going to pay that cost. And then we saw, well, do we want to pay that cost 18 times or just once? Um, and we started thinking, well, what if we could do just one database query per leg of a payment? So 
two database queries in total. That's going to make the system 10 times more efficient, 10 times cheaper. And kind of, I think for Don and I, a lot of this was also like the dream of Mojiloop. Um, you know, like Mojiloop has this dream. It's really an important dream. It's a foundation. It's open source code. Everybody can use it. It's, um, and the idea is that this can really drive down the cost of payments in Africa. It's a noble dream. You know, this can give people access to, to financial services that they just don't have. Um, and you, you and I know this because we, you know, we, we've grown up in, in Africa and we know how difficult it can be, you know, for people to send money back home. Um, yeah, so I guess this was... So am, the, I, am, I correct, know, yeah. am I correct that it's possible to run a little cluster of Tiger Beetle nodes on a Raspberry Pi? Exactly. So I think that's what we, that, was, that was really what Don and I wanted. We were thinking, you know, how can we just make something so cheap, so easy to operate? You can literally deploy it in the harshest environments in Africa, you know, and, and it's a, even a Raspberry Pi. Like, what could a Raspberry Pi achieve? Um, so thanks to Lewis from Australia, he actually just, you know, a friend of ours, he actually went and did it for us. Um, and he got 94,000 payments a second just on a Raspberry Pi um, with, a, with a SD card storage. Um, that, that was, Fair I enough. guess, that, that, that's, that's now if we're turning towards the end of the book and, and trying to read how it ends. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you guys, yeah. um, so... so I mean, clearly, performance was, you know, one of the drivers to to get into uh, Tiger Beetle. So, you know, you had this problem at Modulute that we, we couldn't solve through just fixing the application code. You recognize the need to put the, you know, the logic closer to the data. And you, you, you have this design then, um, uh, Proto Beetle, where you guys, you know, tested some of your assumptions. Um, and, and uh, you know, the we ended up, if I remember correctly, we, we ended up with sort of a, a goal of this this project having three pillars, you know, performance, safety, and developer experience. So let's let's drill a bit more into the performance and then we can get into safety and, and developer experience because I'm I'm keen to cover yeah. some of those as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. so you, you you know you you've now you've identified a way to solve some of that performance. Are there any other you know, are there any, any other things I, I know, you know, of a few that I can think of, but maybe you, you have a better view now of what are the, you know, the, the design decisions you made along the way to really, really eke out, um, you know, the best performance you can from Tiger Beetle. And maybe while you're thinking about that, um, are, are there any compromises you had to make on performance to get the safety and develop experience you wanted or, um, you know, how, how have you managed to balance those out? Yeah, uh, so th this comes back to that that one point, you know, the one of two. So performance, um, Don, you know, Don was shooting rockets and setting world records. We had this dream of mm -hmm. really making Mojoloop a great success, uh, making it really work for people. And so we were kind of motivated by that. Um, you've also touched on on Proto Beetle, which which we I would love to cover, uh, but the the idea for performance was basically we had done you know the waterfall analysis. We saw, we thought, what if we can do one database query for one payment? That's going to be ten x faster. Here comes the the rocket thinking, right? Like, how can we get a thousand times faster? Like, what do we do to do that? Like, let's just ask the question. And what we realized is that payments are pretty small. Um, you've got a, an account ID, a debit account ID, a credit account ID, an ID for the actual payment to uniquely identify it. You've got a 64-bit amount for the payment. Maybe you've got some flags and stuff for future proofing. Um, but you can actually put a lot of these into like a network message, you know, that you send on the network. Um, you can put like Close to, well, I know exactly, actually, you can put 8,191 of these <laughs> in, a, in a one megabyte message. And a one megabyte message in a data center network, that just flies like Superman. You know, you can get that to other machines very quickly. It, it also amortizes, you know, you've got all these little costs as you jump onto the network, as you come off the NIC, you come into the kernel's receive buffer for TCP, from there, you get you know, there's a syscall that gets you into application space. 
now you've got the data off the wire. Now you have to deserialize it. Now you're, you're, you've got to work on that in main memory. Now you've got cache misses to the, the CPU's caching you know, hierarchy and now the CPU's working on it. So basically you've got, you've got network bandwidth, network latency. You've got um, storage bandwidth, storage latency because you're always writing to disk. Um, you've got memory bandwidth, memory latency, and finally you've got CPU bandwidth, CPU latency. These are the four resources and their performance characteristics. So we just realized, look, if we can put 8,191 8, payments in one megabyte, one megabyte is very, very friendly to all four of these resources. You know, you can send it across the NIC, and all those little costs, you know, only paying them once, you amortize. So batching is the insight there. We kind of realized what we needed was a database that that sees everything as a batch, whether it's a batch of one or 8,191, because that way, as your application gets hotter, you know, as it's Black Friday or Shopify does one of their promotions and your Stripe, now all of a sudden you're keeping up because you're just amortizing that extra load. You're, you're being more friendly to the hardware. So we realized the interface must change so that we can do, it's not enough anymore to do one payment in one database query. We want to start exploring, let's do on the order of 10,000. Imagine, you know, you can, you can make a single round trip to your database and you've just executed 10,000 payment instructions. Um, it, it makes natural sense, you know, to do it that way. Um, so that, that was what we did. And then coming to your question of does that conflict with safety? Well, we found it didn't because, your data, you know, that's your data plane, this one meg of instructions. And the actual switching logic, and, and now by switching, I mean, you know, your consensus protocol or replication protocol, your logic for writing to disk, all of that is like control plane logic that you can actually put in tons of assertions and to check everything, check, double check, double check. But, but when you're checking things, the cost of those CPU checks is now again amortized across a one meg buffer. So it's actually the, those, those CPU calculations to do the checks become very, very cheap also. So you get this great, it's like a super idea, you know, this, this elegance where you have a super fast system and you have a super safe system because you've cleanly delineated between control plane and data plane. Often we just think of everything as a batch of one and that leads us to designs where we don't have a control plane and a data plane. And, and another way of, of seeing those is basically think of like a dam, you know, that's storing a lot of water the, the water shoots through these massive, massive pipes. That's the data plane. That's the high volume stuff that just pumps through there. Then think of the little control room, you know, and you've got the two people that eat their sandwiches there and they've got all the, the monitoring dashboards. That, that's the control plane. And so the control plane, you want to pay a lot of, um, in, you know, a lot of attention to safety, like, is it okay if 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 Yoran and Adrian are sitting there eating their lunch and Yoran can flip the switch and Adrian can swip, flip the opposite switch, and there you want to have all kinds of checks and balances and um, but the actual part where the water just flows through the pipeline that can be like frictionless and and big volume and so that that was kind of the design the design that we came up with you know looking at Moja Loop, but then then just quickly to come into land here. Um, the and and yeah, um, I guess the other the other part of it was we we could you could see that these concepts these are concepts that everybody knows you know they're not they're not new, but we could just see that this would really work well for Merge Loop. I guess the crunch was at what point you know do you move from the local maxima to somewhere else, and there like if I can go a little bit longer. Um, we, it was a bit of like a rebel, a rebel, um, I, I was a bit of a rebel there. So we, you know, there, there are lots of contractors in Mojo Loop and um, there were ideas on, on what we should be doing. And I was seeing this and thinking, well, you know, we can, we can do it this way. And really, you know, we, we could be spending a whole year on fine tuning MySQL, getting 10% 
gain. Or, you know, we can spend a year and get a, um, an exponential gain three, three times over in the exponent. And then, so I, I basically, it just came to a point where on a Sunday, uh, I don't think I even charged you for this at the time. Like I was, it was winter. It was, I think it was a July and winter, you know? And I mean, Eddie, we, did, we just basically did this work on the basis of a, of a handshake also, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like, that was kind of the trust, you know, that we had. So I, I think it was like a, a July winter. I had a fire going, it was raining in Cape Town. And I just decided, okay, now's the time, you know, it's been three months and let's just try this idea out. So I didn't charge for it. And I, I basically did a whole performance sketch called Proto Beetle. And I, I did it on my, my home laptop and, um, I, it took me five hours, you know, and all the big ideas in Tiger Beetle are there in Proto Beetle, like all the, the, the value, you know, the breakthrough, I think, if it is, um, we, we, I, I sketched it out like that and, and we had the, you know, how, how do we interact with the disk if we take this idea of batching? How do we interact with the network? What about wire protocol, cryptographic checksumming? So I basically wrote it all up in five hours, like just a very quick performance sketch to do all the fundamental, you know, functions. Um, and that that arrived, that was called Proto Beetle. So then you were so awesome as a manager because we used to sync, you know, as a team every Friday, uh, lots of stories there. And, um, and then I think I came and just showed you guys and I said, well, like, lots of walking you... meetings. And lots of walking meetings. We would catch up, walk around the block. Mm. Um, but yeah, then I just brought in Proto Beetle and said, hey, you know, Don and I managed to optimize Merge Loop. You know, we did. Um, we got it from 76 TPS to like 140. And then here was Proto Beetle and we could do um, 200,000 two-phase transfers on, a, on my home laptop, which was a very old MacBook Air 2012 model. Um, and I mean, that I didn't expect that. That just gave me goosebumps to think that, wow, like we could actually maybe do this. You know, it's, um, here are all the design ideas all there. And um, so, and then I think from then on, it's just credit to you because you had a twinkle in your eye and you said, you're on, I must tell you about this idea I had. You know? right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know that idea, <laughs> a financial <laughs> database, but one yeah. that I had absolutely no confidence in being able to build. So, yeah, another piece of serendipity there that, that I met you, somebody with the, the technical shops to do it. Uh, and that's actually, a, I, I think that's a nice segue um, because, I, I you know, one thing I've noticed working with you um, that has really stood out for me, and you, 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 you said something earlier that reminded me of it was, you know, the fact that you learned a lot of your programming just through reading books is that you you read profusely um, and you read academic papers and, and papers about you know very uh, esoteric and, and and challenging problems that are really like you know highly technical and the kind of stuff that I, I think the majority of people would glaze over post the abstract um, and, and then try and apply that into into uh, you know what you're doing so I think certainly for me a standout of this project has been that uh, every design decision has considered what's kind of the state of the art coming out of you know really um, interesting corners of the world where people are doing not necessarily uh, you know directly relevant research but they're doing something experimentation or research that that uh, has a little tidbit that you've managed to tease out and then apply into Tiger Beetle. Um, I mean, one obvious one, which is, you know, it's not it's not new, but I think you've given it new life is view stamp replication. Uh, but there are a few there. I, I don't know if you want to talk through a couple of the, the you know, academic papers or the, the pieces of work that you think are, are, you know, very inspirational or have been critical to the design of Tiger Beetle. Oh, thanks, Eddie. Yeah, I think it's so nice, you know, to to have a problem that you're working on and to realize that, you know, I'm stuck with this problem. And then also to see, like, a lot of people have really spent seven years just on this problem. And then to go and, like, learn from those people and, 
you can't always, you know, here and, you know, you can't always get to meet them face to face, but you get to, to kind of engage with them as if you're hanging out and you can read their thoughts because they've written it for you in a great paper, you know, and that's such a nice way of getting into computer science, I feel, because it's not like you're learning about dusty things for no reason at all. You've got like a real dream, a real motivation to solve a problem. And you can just go and find people who've done it. And um, I think maybe the other thing is that because I didn't study it formally, I kind of always felt that I had to go and read the papers. And I used to find it really hard. And sometimes you read a paper and it doesn't make sense. And then I delivered, I'd kind of like come up, came up with this trick where what you do is you read the paper and it makes like absolutely no sense. And then, but you've just read it through and you didn't understand it at all. And then next week you do it again. Uh, and then maybe you do it again with another related paper. And maybe like, like a few weeks later, then it slowly starts to make sense, you know? And um, so that was one trick where you just don't worry. Like, don't worry if it doesn't make sense, just read it anyway. And then come back. To the, <laughs> that's come, a, come. That's a, a handy <laughs> one. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to try that. I'll definitely okay. give it a go. I don't know if it's if it's very encouraging, uh, uh, but I remember like just trying to teach myself binary one day, you know, and I was just frustrated. This was when I was younger, and I was frustrated that I didn't know how to do XOR and and bitwise stuff. And I literally just worked through the night, and I think two a.m. I finally understood why we have <laughs> bits and bytes. Uh, <laughs> so it's just like sometimes you just persevere, you know, and. But I guess the other trick with papers is that what I found was often the papers that didn't explain themselves clearly, maybe they used a lot of like formal language or like notation. Those weren't often, they maybe weren't the best papers. And, and then you had, on the other hand, you had papers by people like Frank McSherry, you know, of Materialize. And he writes, writes the most amazing papers, and they're so fun. They've got humor in them, and they've got titles like a cool and practical alternative to hash tables, you know, stuff like that. And then you think, <laughs> oh, wow, this is just, this is great, you know. And then, so I think with view stamp replication, it was a bit like that, where we realized at some point that it wasn't good enough to have a system of record that runs on a single piece of hardware. You need to have replication. So, and um, the view stamp replication paper from 2012 from MIT was so great. And um, yeah, I guess here we get into all the little, you know, tricks. And I think part of this was, you know, we had to choose, do we choose Paxos or Raft? And some of my heroes like Mark Brooker, Martin Thompson, Heidi Howard, they were all talking about view stamp replication as a pioneer. And they were talking about it as having better latency if if you have to elect a new primary machine as your leader. So, and I also like the idea of the underdog, you know. And on top of it, when I read the view stamp replication paper, uh, this kind of came back to connecting the dots because before we met, I'd been doing like a lot of storage work, and I'd been following the storage team at Dropbox, which is Jamie Turner, CJ Jayakar and James Carling. And then, so I was seeing everything they did and I was, I was reverse engineering their sync algorithms and, you know, using like fuzz testing to find bugs in Dropbox and, and understanding it and seeing what they did with Magic Pocket, which is amazing. They're basically Dropbox's own um, data center solution for like, it's basically S3. They moved James Carling and his team moved the whole of Dropbox off of Amazon S3, like while the while the plane was flying, and they didn't disconnect anybody's in-flight calls. You know, <laughs> so they they just pulled that off. Uh, so I like James was a huge hero, and I'd been following all his. He did some great talks on durability theater, where we think we're making safe systems, but we're not really. And how do we make safe systems? And and then all of a sudden, I, I've come at view stamp replication. I'm reading it already, and I kind of read the paper, and then I look at who wrote it, and I, you can guess who wrote it. You know, James Carling. Yeah. And then, then I thought, okay, this is going to be our consensus protocol. There's no better storage distributed. He's one of the top people in the world at 
at distributed systems. Um, and his paper, you know, two years before Raft, Raft is basically vSTAR amplification by James Cowling. It just doesn't have the deterministic view change, which is so great, um, which is what we really exploit in Tiger Beetle. Um, and I think a lot of this was just like, thanks to your encouragement, you know, that we could, we were always trying to just push the, the edge a little bit, you know, like we weren't trying to be too smart, like not trying to optimize a hundred percent, but we were trying to be like 80% and then let's just find some biodigital jazz, like some cool trick. Let's just have something really cool to demo on, on Friday. Um, and we slowly started putting in all these little ideas. I think a big one was that this came out of this idea of everything is a batch. So what we figured is that in Tiger Beetle, like a cluster of machines is also a batch. Like you can have one Tiger Beetle, machine making up your database, you can have two, you can have three, four, five, you know, normally people run it as three or five. And we thought, well, why not let, let's just, just do the consensus as if it's a spectrum and people can say, well, I want one tiger beetle as my database, like how they normally run Postgres. Cause maybe there's a reason they want to do that. And, and we, you know, you and I were chatting at the time, like maybe people will want to run tiger beetle embedded, you know, in their phone. Um, and then if you do your whole consensus protocol that your cluster is either a cluster of one or two or three or four or five, which most protocols don't do, I don't think. But if you write it that way, you get very nice, simple code because you all your code paths, you have a single code path. You don't have all these edge cases. So you can actually run Tiger Beetle as a single machine. So it's executing the whole consensus protocol, even though it's just one machine, you know, and there's no cost for that. Or, so we, we could, you know, be embedding it later. So, That's yeah, an interesting, other, it's, a, yeah. it's an interesting insight onto, into thinking about scale there, where you, you basically said, you know, um, everything, every transaction is a batch and every instance is a cluster. So there's no such thing as a single transaction and there's no such thing as a single, you know, database node. It's always a cluster and it's always a batch, but it might be a batch of one submitted to a cluster of one. Um, yeah, exactly. And, and I, I guess what's really, what's really sort of novel about that or quite, quite exciting about that is the simplicity, which I, is, is what you, you know, pointing out that your, your code parts are, are designed that way up front. Um, that's a, it's a really great insight, I think. Um, and, and, uh, and, and a nice way of thinking of things. Um, yeah. so, so I guess that sort of, that, in many respects that covers off the, the, the safety pillar that we, we talked about. So you've got, you know, performance safety and then, and then I know developer experience was always a key thing. Uh, you know, you talked earlier about, all of the different flags you have to tweak when you're running a MySQL instance on various different pieces of hardware or in different contexts. Um, and it sounds like this idea of, um, you know, running, only having one way to run a cluster of Tiger Beetle is probably yeah. part of that, you know, goal of making the developer experience simple and easy. Uh, is, there, is there other stuff you have in mind or other things you've done differently, let's say, to other databases uh, that you think are key to the developer experience? Yeah, so you you also always push me like that, which has been great, mm -hmm. you know, and we we were also like lucky at the time because it was, a, it was kind of like a new chapter for databases. The page was just turning, you know, and while we were thinking about Tiger Beetle, there was Red Panda launching and like Red Panda had it in spades. Like, you know, they, before, if you wanted to deploy Kafka, you had to deploy all these other stuff with it, you know, like Zookeeper. And so you've got like three distributed systems just to have one. And Red Panda said, well, you should just have a single binary. Like it's just going to, here's a binary, just put it on a machine and run it and you're good. So, we kind of got that that idea from them that you should just have a single binary. Um, I guess we wanted a good developer experience. Also, we wanted to make it really easy for people to read the code of Tiger Beetle. We wanted like a very fast language, as fast as C, but it needed to read easier. We wanted it to read like TypeScript, you know, and, and there I guess we hit it on Zig. Uh, that was how I pitched it, you know, like 
hey, this is TypeScript, but it's C. <laughs> uh, and yeah, and then otherwise, I guess the, the financial primitives, they're the most convenient because all of a sudden, like Moduli, you know, or a, a system, they, they could take these 10,000 lines of code and just delete it. And suddenly they've got a very nice, like Node.js client. They can just create a batch of 10,000 accounts in one database query. And in their second database query, they can execute 10,000 money movements between these accounts. Um, and just giving people those primitives. I guess we also really fought hard to have the two-phase commit primitive so that this idea that the, the database should do the heavy lifting for you, it should do all the hard work. If your domain has to count things, double entry is great. Like you don't have to use it only for, for FinTech, you know, this is for everything like gaming, you know, scores or um, energy, you know, as you switch energy to the grid and back. Um, and anything can count, like like Ratatouille, you know. Um, and then <laughs> with, with our two-phase transfers, the idea was, well, sometimes you have these counts, but you also want to move them safely into maybe your new system or into a partner system. And so then we gave the primitives so that the developer just doesn't have to worry about any of this stuff. And I guess maybe that's also why we focused on the performance and safety is that Tiger Beetle is just going to be rock solid. Like a single binary, you deploy it, it's just going to run. The hard disks are going to fail. They're going to go radioactive on you. And everything's just going to be smooth, seamless. Latency is going to be like what what um, someone uh, yeah, someone once said, it is like a religious experience. You know? Latency is just going to be just perfectly smooth. You know, like, like, uh, like, yeah, like just a, a flat, flat sea of, of water, you know, that you wakeboard on. <laughs> or, uh, but just super smooth experience uh, where this whole system just runs, it just works. And I guess we focused so hard on the foundations for that so that we didn't cut corners. Um, and actually we did it, I think we didn't take too long, you know, to, to, to do it. Um, get these ideas in and, and obviously we've still got tons of work, lots of rough edges. Um, but these are, yeah, I guess like those are the, you know, the primitives and our documentation is in a appalling state. Like we need to, really, really <laughs> this is where we're at now. <laughs> so. That's a, that's, that's okay. I, I, I think, um, I, I have to say that, you know, the, that was a big call, uh, when you, you, you were determined to use SIG, but, uh, based on, you know, I, I've, I've only barely, you know, uh, dip my toes in with with any of the code there um but based on you know what i've heard from folks who have worked with it and, and worked with tiger beetle it it it's an ideal language from that perspective uh, in that it is so easy to read you know and so i think you you bought yourself some time there in terms of the documentation if you want people to contribute to the code base <laughs> or understand what it's doing reading the code is certainly a lot easier than if you had written it in um in uh in c uh, yeah. so so yeah go, go double whammy by choosing zig in in that case um but i i think the the interesting thing with how you've designed tiger beetle and the, the concept of a cluster and a client you know uh it's sort of an active client um is is quite unique uh, and, and, you know, we've certainly enjoyed using it um, from the Fainbow side. You know, we, it's, it's, a, it's a key piece of the Rafiki open source project, which we're using, and we're using it internally as well for our own accounting, um, accounting system. So I, I think uh, from our perspective, you know, obviously we're, we're on the bleeding edge. So, so even given that, <laughs> the, the experience has been, has been pretty positive so far. Um, <laughs> And thanks uh -huh. again to Don. We keep bringing Don up here, but he, you know, for the for the work on kicking off the Go client. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, looking forward, I guess, to 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 clients in other languages making it more accessible to other uh, to other environments. And and something you touched on there, which you know, which I should mention, and and the part of the reason why this is at the base of this, you know, whole stack, you've got Fainboss um, who are building on top of Rafiki, the open source you know, interledger stack, which is built on top of Tiger Beetle was at the end of the day, I think the thing that probably pushed this project over the line in terms of getting the go ahead from uh, the likes of Miller at, at Gates Foundation and, and Stefano Coyle was the fact that 
the two phase commit just fits so elegantly into how interledger works and and i think you you've you've mentioned it but it's worth saying explicitly you know the the fact that you need to run if you're running a piece of software that's part of a distributed financial network where you've got transactions in transaction messages in and then out but you don't actually want to commit the financial transaction till you get a response that two-phase commit built right into the database with the ability to, you know, do the timeouts um, and those cryptographic primitives built right in. I, I, personally, I think it's a it's a fantastic design decision. I guess we'll see as we go how, um, you know, once it's once it's out in the wild, um, yeah. how that goes. From what I understand, I, I haven't been close to the Moduli project for for a few months now. From what I understand. You know the the impact there has been been pretty significant. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks, Eddie. It's uh, it's been fantastic. Also, that Fainboss is even building on Tiger Beetle. It was pretty bold of you as well. You know, I hope the blood loss. You know, you're on the bleeding edge. I hope the blood loss hasn't, <laughs> hasn't, hasn't been too major. <laughs> no, 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 not so far. <laughs> um, you 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 mentioned uh, something else a little bit earlier, which I think is worth. Uh, digging into a bit more it's uh, it lighten things up in the last few minutes um you, you were talking about music so so tell me about what made you uh what inspired you to put together the tiger tracks that was a unique one for me and i, I i'm i haven't met somebody who's so passionate about their project and thinks about it from so many different angles uh before where you know you weren't just uh reading academic papers and trying to design a great database you were thinking about giving it cartoon characters and a, a soundtrack and uh, <laughs> you know all these all these other things that that normally uh you know don't come up until you hire a really good marketing uh marketing team so, yeah. so where did that where did the idea for tiger tracks come from Oh, thanks. Um, I guess I've got to credit maybe my old auditing professor. Like I learned, you know, accounting can be fun <laughs> at university, but he used to sometimes rock up to our tutorials wearing a, a full length, like black leather coat with a Darth Vader helmet. And that was how he would do, like that was Darth Vader now for auditing, like serious, you know, uh, like... <laughs> And I guess otherwise accounting maybe was a bit boring, but I, I was just so excited about Tiger Beetle, like the idea that it can it can really change people's lives and it can make a little bit of a dent, just easier, more fun systems. And I guess there, there was the saying, someone came up with it, I think it was in the Zig community, that the more mascots a programming language has, the higher its likelihood of success. I don't know if that's the Loris Pro... <laughs> L the L Loris's rule or L Loris's law, but he he got Joey Max in from Brazil to do some of the Zig art, and I don't know. I, sometimes you just have these ideas and you just run with it. So we got in touch with Joey. He did the tiger art, and I guess like coming back to that moment, you know, that five hours on a Sunday that I just went and did something off on my own, like a little hobby project, Proto Beetle, and it, you know, I didn't mention it earlier, but essential to that was the album um by black keys the black keys um, um i so think that was, was the called... original tiger that was the original tiger track yeah i listened to that whole album and that that got proto beetle like uh <laughs> that that album i mean proto beetle was coded to black keys and and then kind of from Amazing. there yeah then I, I chatted to don one day i came in with this idea to work and i said hey don like let's on Spotify, let's put our favorite tracks on, you know, while we're coding because music is such a big part of it. You know, we've got our headphones on and we're, we're just trying to keep our heads just from bopping visibly. But otherwise, <laughs> you know, there's, and I guess you and I, you know, we're, we're like 10 years ahead of everybody else in the office. We're like a whole nother lost generation. So you and I are chatting about music references that nobody, you know, they won't even old men of Old men of the grunge era, eh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I mean, you, so, you, so you've last, been a big, big impact on Tiger Tracks yourself. <laughs> uh, last, last thing I want to, I want to cover because I, I, I know we, I'm conscious we've, we've already almost an hour, almost an hour's up. Time flies. Oh, man. Fun. Um, yeah. The, the Vopper. There's a throwback to, 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 uh, 
something from our era, the, the original Whopper. Um, yeah. That's a unique and, and novel concept, this idea of a, a, I don't know what you want to call it, a self-testing, self-healing database. Yeah. Is that, is that, you know, tell me, tell me, maybe, maybe share a little bit more um, for those who don't know what it is, what the Vopper does and, and, and how it sort of fits into the picture with Tiger Beetle. And then, uh, you. and then, you know, maybe expand on that and, and tell us what you think is sort of the, the next steps, the future for Tiger Beetle. Okay, thanks, Eddie. So, yeah, I guess this kind of really gets to, we've touched on it a bit, like databases of the future are all around us. We just have to go and see them. They're there. They're, they're going to be built, you know, like I think it, the world could only afford one or two general purpose databases for quite a long time. And we're getting to the point where it's quicker and quicker to build fantastic safe databases. Uh, we're going to see like an explosion of different databases for different domains. It's like the Model T Ford, you know, you can have any color so long as it's black. And now you can have all kinds, you know, you can have a Honda CRV um, um, or you can have a scooter. So the, I think the key to databases of the future is going to be this new testing style from Foundation DB called deterministic simulation testing. And basically what that is, is, yeah, so databases of the future, they're going to test themselves automatically. They're going to be like thousands of bots that just simulate all kinds of random universes and, and run clusters and throw hail fire and Thor's lightning bolt and storage faults. You know, they're going to corrupt the disk, mess with the network cables, and they're going to automate all of this. And it's going to be a very simple testing code to write. It's going to take you like two weeks to write a testing harness like this once you've got the idea. It's a very simple idea. And then your whole database is going to test itself perfectly. It's going to be like your very own Carl Kingsbury, um, but maybe without the sense of humor, but it's going to be like you can just run this on your laptop. You can, as you build in your database, you can just run a local simulation and test it completely and get massive assurance. Um, and even more so, like your simulator is not only going to like test your database, but it's even going to tell you like, hey, you've got a bug in your consensus protocol. It's a liveness bug. Or, hey, it's a correctness bug. This is data loss. It's going to even classify the bugs that it finds. And then finally, it's going to like report them for you as a, as a nice GitHub issue. So, and that's kind of what, what we've done, you know, with, with the Vopper from War Games. Um, I guess that for me was the final, when I saw the Vapa first running, it was just a magical experience. I, I couldn't believe that you could do this with software, you know? So I'm just, yeah, I'm just so grateful to you, Adrian, for backing me with Tiger Beetle, you know, and that we could play some soccer together and <laughs> write code together and even hang out in the same office. Um, yeah, it's been an amazing two years experience. Yeah, it's been a, yeah. it's been a, a, been a great pleasure. So, so, um, Tell me, tell me then before we wrap up, how many, how many of your bugs has the Vapa uncovered? Of my bugs? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess if, it, if it's a bug, it's mine. Uh, yeah, so, so I think we're probably up to like 40 or 50. And That's outstanding. So, so the Vapa yeah. is finding bugs that nobody else found previously in code review or unit tests or whatever, just purely through fuzz testing, you've, you've uncovered and fixed 40 bugs without yeah. that code ever going, wow, that's, that's and amazing. The, and the amazing thing is, you know, when it finds the bug, it gives you a little number called the seed. So I, if it's 5 p.m. my side, I find, you, find the bug, I just drop that number in the Slack. 